Right, I think we're live. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today. Uh, this is the first Brave and Whiskey webinar. Uh, we're aiming to do one on a quarterly basis. So thank you for joining for the first time. Um, my name is Mihai. Uh, I'm one of the portfolio managers here at Braben. I'm joined by Josh, and he's also one of the portfolio managers. And just before we kick things off, you know, the purpose of this webinar is to give you a little bit of an insight in whiskey cask investing, and answer some of your questions, and, and just get you a little bit more familiar with uh, Braben as well. A, a, a little bit of background on myself and um, I've been involved in the financial industry for the past sort of six seven years and um, my journey with whiskey is a little bit unusual because about three years ago I invested in casks actually with Braeburn so I am working with Braeburn but I'm also a investor with Braeburn so today I'm sitting in a different chair than I was three years ago um, and that's kind of what sparked my interest in cask ownership and I just wanted to be a little bit more involved in the whole process okay uh, yeah you undersold your love for it then yeah. um, so yeah so I, again I mean I, I'm one of the portfolio managers my journey with whiskey is a bit different than me guys um, I originally also come from a finance background, um, so I spent many years in investment banking between uh, London and Hong Kong, so I spent time in Asia. Um, unfortunately enough, I mean, my introduction to, to whiskey began with a uh, Japanese single malt, so I, when I was in uh, Hong Kong. And just through my time there and kind of introducing um, or being introduced to, to Scottish whiskey, I sort of slowly fell in love with it. And um, I actually met one of the uh, the current employees of the company many years back. And, and that's where I was introduced to Braeburn Whiskey. And yeah, here I am. So I, I sort of um, are now building these portfolios of clients and uh, introducing them the same way that I was um, and enjoying the process. So yeah, awesome. And just a bit of, a, of an agenda for today. Uh, I can move the slide. And um, what we'll cover today, so a little bit about Braeburn, Braeburn Whiskey, who we are, what we do as a company, and how we can uh, help our investors. Then, of course, we'll give you an introduction to the whiskey investment market. Uh, so just covering some of the current uh, market conditions, the current landscape, and key points to consider. Okay. Um, and then following that, we will sort of deep dive into who Braeburn Whiskey partner with. So who our client base is predominantly made from, um, you know, typically sort of from our institutional and independent investors, um, but also we'll take a look into, you know, some of the bottlers we work with um, and some of the relationships we also have with collectors as well. Um, and then from there, you know, we'll run you through the, the investment process. So really, you know, how that investment cycle looks like from start to finish, um, you know, and how we work with clients in building that portfolio um, and how we proposition that and make that very simple for them from start to finish. Um, and again, you know, we'll, we'll tie that in with the extra options that we typically see as well. Um, so, you know, the different avenues that investors can explore when it comes to, you know, reselling and liquidating uh, their investment. Exactly. Um, and then the last key points of today's webinar would be focused around your questions. So um, when you registered, some of you submitted some uh, already kind of burning thoughts. So we'll address those. We'll answer some of those questions and the FAQs. And then, of course, there'll be a live Q&A session as well, as promised. So um, you have on, on Zoom, uh, this is set up as such that you can actually submit questions in the chat um, throughout the duration of this webinar. And at the end, we'll go through as many of those as possible uh, time allowing. We, we have one hour and should have plenty of time for everything. So please keep all the questions uh, coming and we'll address those towards the end. Okay. So just to kick things off, Josh, um, give us yeah. a little bit of an introduction on, on Braeburn Whiskey. Uh, so yeah, just to kind of give you some figures and to really give you an insight into the company um, and what we do here. Uh, so Braeburn Whiskey have been in the market for just over five years now. Um, to give you an idea of the scale, so we have three offices globally. Uh, we have two in Europe, uh, one based in Scotland, of course, which is kind of um, where our, history, our core, um, where it all started, and that's where our headquarters is. We have the office in Barcelona, 
which really heads up our operations throughout Europe. Um, and then we have our Asia Pacific office, which is based in Singapore, uh, which of course uh, you know, really looks to service our clients that are based in you know, mainland China, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, uh, and Japan as well. Um, and I mean, just to give you an idea of kind of what our, our clients look like worldwide. So we have just over 2000 clients that we're currently managing portfolios for, um, of which that come or equates to around about three or just over 3000 tasks that we currently have under management. Um, and again, I mean, just to give you a snapshot of you know, some of the statistics of those casks. So the oldest cask we have under management is 40 years in age, um, which again, you can imagine that's a, a very beautiful and, uh, you know, antique liquid at this point. So, um, yeah, it's a privilege to be managing that cask. Um, and the most expensive cask that we've actually sold and been fortunate enough to manage for a client was valued at just over 1.2 million pounds. Um, which again is a, an incredible value for a cost. It is indeed. So there's definitely a lot of potential there for growth in whiskey. Um, so give you a bit of a of a market overview um, and some of the key points that sh you should take in consideration before making a decision to invest in whiskey. Um, over the past sort of three years, um, we've been delivering a market report. It's called the BC20 report. So this, uh, this report analyzes data uh, on previous sell sold casks between three different companies. Um, and it's been going, it's been collecting data over the past six years, um, analyzing about five, 6,000 different casks. And the annual average capital growth across all casks uh, observed in the latest report um, was 12.84 percent okay um, we typically see the the average cast and, and this is what we translate to our investors deliver somewhere between 10 to 13 percent on average um, which is almost identical to the report that was issued at the beginning of 2021. Um, this was a, uh, this report in 2021 was released twice, once at the beginning of the year, once towards the end. The new report will be launched within the next couple of months. Uh, so you will see the most up-to-date figures there, um, but rest be assured it's uh, a, a stable uh, a stable rate. And this is exactly what we've been seeing you know, over the past few years. Um, you know, considering a, a very, you know, slowing whiskey production throughout 2020, uh, global pandemic happened, COVID was around, we've seen a lot of distilleries closing their doors, um, a lot of distilleries slowing down production at a fraction of their full, um, you know, output capacity. capacity. Um, but, you know, we're seeing that the market continues to show uh, stable growth and in increasing consumption of most global consumers. Um, and I think, Josh, that the main kind of factor here is, you know, throughout all of these years, we've been seeing uh, an increase in demand, but supply just not being able to keep up uh, with the increase in course. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really important um, point to, to kind of consider with, with whiskey. I mean, the, the industry, you know, at the end of the day, it is made up, um, of demand from whiskey drinkers, you know, the end cycle for all of these casks will always end up in a bottle, uh, you know, being enjoyed by, um, you know, by the consumer. Um, so if we look at, as Mihai has just mentioned there, you know, the the impact that current climate has, I mean, with COVID, um, you know, the drop in production that the whiskey industry saw as a result, um, you know, that may have been detrimental for the production of whiskey, but the consumption of whiskey has only continued to grow, um, which of course, as you can imagine, the, you know, the more people consume a product, um, but the more finite in supply it becomes, the higher the value, the higher the price that that obviously will see in the market. Um, so typically, as you've just said, it may be um, unfortunate for distilleries that they're sort of slowing production, but from an investment standpoint, um, you know, it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity to buy into an asset that over time, um, you know, will benefit from that kind of a climate. Absolutely. And we're seeing, you know, with what's, uh, you know, if the, the current uh, global events that are happening in Russia and in Ukraine involving Russia, and um, Brexit, COVID, all of these factors um, really affected the production of whiskey in, in a sense of 
the, the raw material needed to uh, produce whiskey, to distill this uh, liquid gold, um, has increased significantly. Um, the reports stating that distilleries were um, anticipating an increase in cost of about 60-70% um, to produce the whiskey. Now, I don't know if that's you know completely accurate and, and how um, you know realistic it is to see an increase of 70%, but we can definitely see already an increase in bottle prices, um, which is you know definitely bad news for uh, probably a lot of whiskey drinkers like uh, like our audience today, like a lot of you listening. Um, but it's very, very good news for investors, and it's still a very good time to invest in whiskey because you know the all the signs are there we're seeing a lot more money being invested in building new distilleries we're seeing a lot more money invested in existing distilleries for their plans of expansion increasing the stills numbers perhaps even uh, opening new distilleries and conquering new markets asia india being a very uh, yeah, hot topic yeah. at the moment with the trade um trade discussions, discussions yeah. yes um, they are basically, to, to give you a little bit of an insight, the uh, UK and Indian government are discussing a lowering uh, tariff uh, sort of agreement where um, the Indian market at the moment is paying somewhere around 100, 150% import tax on scotch, which of course affects um, significantly the yeah. amount of scotch they can actually import, uh, but they're looking at lowering that uh, that number, which is a great opportunity for companies like ourselves, for investors like yourselves as well, because the Indian market is a huge consumer of single malt scotch. Yeah, so it's, a, it's an upward ticking trend that's going to see good growth, and obviously that's a very promising sign for for us as a company and again for investors. So it's, um you know, this is why, especially now in today's climate, it's, it's, it's very you know, exciting to be entering the market on something that's, um, you know, got such promising signs, should we say. Exactly. Um, and a lot of the times some of our clients ask, you know, what happens with my investment if the story that I, um, I secured, I invested in, goes out of business and stops producing whiskey? Well, in most cases, you know, if you were to invest in, in stocks and shares and perhaps that company goes bust, um, your money is gone in, in, in simple terms. Um, this doesn't happen with whiskey. We're actually seeing that a lot of the top names that have stopped releasing cash on the secondary market, <laughs> a Callan, a Lagavulin, Bowmore, Dalmore, Lefroig, um, um, or even distilleries that have stopped producing altogether. Port Charlotte, a very classic example. Right, exactly, yeah. They go for very high premiums because of the scarcity, because of the basically... Um, you not being able to source those casks anymore. So actually with those type of distilleries, you know, we are seeing increased returns. Um, so the top 10 um, distilleries, they witnessed increasing growth in 2021, somewhere around 13 to 19% uh, per, per annum, which of course is higher than that average return, okay? Um, now, just to quote some numbers from the Scotch Whiskey Association that basically gives a good overview of the whiskey uh, market condition. Um, in 2021, the value of Scotch Whiskey ex exports was up 19% by value to 4.51 billion. Um, by value, it means by the actual uh, value of the bottles, not necessarily the quantity. Um, but in quantity terms, the numbers of 70 CL bottles um, also grew by 21% uh, to the equivalent of 1.38 billion. Okay, so this is really good news. Um, but of course, just to, to be transparent and to put it into context, um, you know, despite 2021 being a very good year, we're still recovering as I think most businesses are out there after uh, COVID time. So compared to 2019, which we would um, consider as, as a, as a base point as a threshold for uh, sort of indicating the performance of the market conditions. Um, we're still trending slightly below, but uh, definitely we're going towards the, the green and the, the upwards trajectory, okay? Um, so I hope this gave you a good uh, kind of understanding of the opportunity and I guess the uh, market conditions. So of course, you know, the, the, the normal thing to discuss now would be how to actually get involved and how to benefit from these market conditions. Absolutely. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, next, just to kind of give you an idea again of um, who Braeburn Whiskey really partner with. Um, so to give you an idea of the different clients that we're currently building relationships with, um, you know, whether that be traditionally what we've been working with in terms of you know, independent investors, um, and even more so now we're moving into uh, more institutional investors where the market's changing. We're seeing far more institutional um, you know, players that enter the market. Um, what this ideally will allow us to do is have a, a very good insight into what we actually do uh, in terms of the portfolios we manage. Um, so predominantly, Braeburn Whiskey's client base is made up from independent investors. Um, so these are you know, just investors that are looking to diversify existing portfolios. Um, you know, these are people that have you know, many different investment goals, whether it be wealth preservation, um, you know, looking to set themselves up for future retirement or a retirement fund, um, you know, looking to set up children, um, you know, as future investments, things to sort of pass on to family and friends. Um, but also people that are just looking to you know, make their money work harder, essentially, um, you know, looking for a more profitable return than you'd see from you know, traditional avenues, things like stocks or, or even sitting the money in the bank. Um, you know, so these are you know, investors that are just looking to kind of, you know, um, make their portfolios more versatile, essentially. Um, now, again, given changes in current climate, given that more and more people are becoming aware of whiskey as an alternative investment, um, <clears throat> and given, again, how robust the market has been over the past couple of years, as, as Mihai touched on just earlier, um, you know, we are seeing a, a more of an influx now from institutional investors also. Um, so, I mean, these can be made up of uh, you know, corporates, uh, companies that are looking to you know, diversify uh, investment funds looking to you know have a subset of their capital in alternative assets which again is where whiskey sort of plays their part um or we have other companies that are looking to um you know act as uh, introducers and they'll be looking to sell these assets on to their own clients so there's there's different avenues um, that we work with on the institutional side we've, we've been seeing that um people are getting a lot more creative on the on the uh, alternative asset sort of opportunities. There's a lot of companies out there that are uh, providing sort of shares in collectibles, shares in a lot of alternative uh, options, even classic cars, wine, and now whiskey as well. So that provides quite a good opportunity for us to establish partnerships uh, with companies as such, which, you know, over the past three, four years, uh, perhaps they haven't been as popular um, as before. Then, of course, you know, you have the independent um, investor, you have the institutional investor. Um, but if, another big side of our business is the bottlers. So the independent bottling companies, you'll see that uh, there's, there's quite a lot of them out there. Uh, they all try to source the best liquid possible, um, bottle it with their own branding, with their own labeling, and then, of course, reselling that to their own uh, market. But apart from the independent bottling companies, um, we do see another um, side of the bottling element. We see some passion uh, investors. So these would be uh, individual investors that just have a passion in whiskey. They, um, they buy casks for their own consumption with the idea of holding them for a few years and then bottling them for their own enjoyment perhaps for a company release sharing with partners with family with friends whatever that may be um so there's there's a lot of opportunity uh, there's a lot of um reasons for why you know people uh, and companies investors like yourselves are considering such an uh, such an investment um and of course you know um i guess it would be it'd be fair to kind of cover the topics of how do you actually invest in whiskey and what, what how that that process uh, look like yeah make it simple um <clears throat> so yeah i mean you know what we are really doing here um at the forefront is, is trying to simplify this investment process as much as possible um you know i feel like whiskey traditionally um has for many years been reserved for bottlers people that of course are um buying into very high value premium casks that you know the general um, investment uh, makeup or the investment sort of uh, you know, people in investments typically wouldn't consider as an option for them. 
Um, what we are, you know, Brayburn do here, and this is really where we've seen the gap in the market, is giving investors now access to the investment market and making it more accessible, um, you know, whether it be just the process in general uh, or the general investment amount. Yeah, more, more accessible and easier to, to understand. Um, there's not such high entry barriers as before. Um, there's a lot more opportunities to source casks from reputable distilleries. Um, you know, casks that in the past, you know, take it back 10, 15 years ago, you weren't able to source, you weren't able to invest in unless you knew you know, the, the top people in the industry was a very select club. So Braben really has been brought uh, on and has been created to narrow that gap in the market and to make an, uh, an investment as uh, cask ownership more attractive, more tailored easy to well, understand, tailored, tailored uh, to the client. Because then my job and, and Josh's job as portfolio managers is really to understand the client, what are their needs, um, what are their comfort levels in terms of holding period budgets, what they want to achieve with such an investment um, and recommend basically the best cast to them, uh, whether that be a, a single, you know, a single cast or a portfolio of cast, depending on their needs. Um, that is our job and that's how we guide our clients throughout the process. And I think, yeah, that, that really summarizes and, and kind of puts into context the selection phase. So as you can see here on the screen, the, the start of this process is, you know, is selection. So we are looking to do what you know, Mihai has just said there. You know, we are really working out and, and finding out what your investment profile is. And we're matching you with, the, you know, the ideal cask uh, that's going to help achieve those investment goals. Um, and then again, I mean, the next step we move on to is simply the acquisition. Um, so with all casks that the clients purchase, they are purchasing the cask directly from Rayburn Whiskey. Um, so these, you know, these casks are held under our ownership. At the point of purchase, um, the investor will receive a purchase agreement from Brayburn Whiskey, which of course is the terms and conditions of purchase. Um, once they are comfortable with signing that, um, they then have three to five business days to settle the remaining balance on a cask. Once that is then completed, the ownership rights and ownership documentation is then transferred into the investor's name. Now, what comes with that, of course, is the beneficial ownership and the ownership rights of that asset are then moved in to the client's name. So they are then the sole owner of that asset. What Braeburn Whiskey then do, you know, as part of the management service is we act as a custodian on behalf of the client. Uh, so we are managing that cask within our warehouse, ensuring that it's aging and maturing in a safe environment, of course, in a dullage system, um, under insurance, of course, so it's secure uh, you know, and it's being managed there in, in, in a nice um, you know, environment where it's going to bring around value over the next 5, 10 to 15 years. Um, and again, I mean, the, the storage side of things, um, me and I can kind of elaborate on the dullage system and how that works um, to give you some insight into actually how that is, is managed in-house by our, our team there. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I think it's important to just have a, a bit of a reflection on, on the process from start to um, finish uh, or until kind of the storage um, element. So. That the first step, just to, to recap, is to select the cask, to identify the right one for you. This is a patience game. Um, the, the right cask might be available within one, two days. The right cask might be available within a couple of weeks. It's just a case of understanding that this is uh, a case of, uh, of, of being patient and having the opportunity to invest in the right cast. Uh, the acquisition is fairly straightforward. You'll also have access to the online platform alongside with the documentation. And then once you're the legal owner, you know that cast will be transferred into our warehouse. Um, this is something very, very exciting for Braeburn because it's our private warehouse. It's something that we've opened in the last year yeah. uh, to visitors. By visitors, I mean to client, client visits. Um, and this is something where, you know, yourselves, if you decide to become a, a Brabant client, you'll have the opportunity to go to Speyside, is in Craig Ellicke, um, in the heart of Speyside, you can see the McAllen distillery from the uh, warehouse doors there from the entrance. Um, and you can go see your, your cask, you can actually sample the, the liquid inside as well. Um, the Danish system that Josh was mentioning is basically a system that we've decided to adopt as part of a um, 
basically the opportunity to ensure that we can have the best um, environment for the casks. A lot of these warehouses, there's hundreds of them scattered across Scotland, um, and they are basically hand, it, held in palletized versions. So there's rows and rows and rows on top of each other of casks. Danish system is something that you see, it's, it looks similar to what you see on the picture or the kind of uh, drawing behind the acquisition. Um, Cross uh, phase there with the with the three casks. That ensures that the warehouse manager has a very good visibility of the of every single cask to ensure there's no leakage. They do health checks on a regular basis, and of course they rotate and they um, ensure that the right conditions, the right temperature, the right humidity, and so on and so forth are in place. Okay, and um, so you've selected your cask, you know, you've purchased that cask, the cask is yours, it's maturing in a HMRC bonded warehouse or a government regulated facility in Speyside. Fast forward 10, 15, 20 years, that maturation process is happening, your liquid is changing, and that's when, you know, you would come and, 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 um, basically give us the opportunity or, or want to exit that option, okay? Um, there's two ways in which you can actually monetize your investment. The first one would be the bottling route. Um, so transferring the asset from cask form into bottle form. Um, this is typically popular with independent bottling companies. This is typically uh, popular with passion investors. Um, and you do have to take into consideration the fact that um, there are additional costs for bottling, for labeling. It is quite a lengthy process and you do have to pay some uh, duty to HMRC. Okay, um, But I think, Josh, the, the, the preferred way of exiting for most investors, perhaps for most of you listening today, is the simple transfer of ownership. Yeah, of course. I mean, the majority of investors, if you're looking at this as you know, um, a return on investment, um, asset, something to maximize your return, then buying and selling in cask form is always recommended. Um, now, of course, it does come with tax benefits. Um, you know, given it's, uh, it's held in bond, uh, it's a duty suspended asset. So as long as you're buying that cask and reselling it back to the market in cask form, then it's capital gains tax exempt. So you're not obviously liable to declare any capital gains tax on that asset. Um, within the UK, of course. Um, so it's a huge benefit for any investor that's looking to maximise their return um, and, of course, you know, minimise the, the tax aspect that they need to pay on that. Um, and again, that's why most of our investors nowadays are you know, choosing that option uh, when it comes to exit. Um, and again, I mean, so that's really giving you an insight and a breakdown as to the process and, and obviously the, the cycle in which investors will follow from you know, start to finish. Um, of obviously their, their sort of purchasing process. Um, so I hope obviously that's clear. I'm sure some of you will obviously have questions on that. So we'll look to, um, to answer those at the end. If there were any points in there that you were kind of unclear on or points you wanted us to cover, we'll, we'll sort of cover those at the end as well. Um, bear with us. So next up, we, again, I mean, the, the idea of this was to answer kind of the common questions that are in the market. So things that most of our clients are asking us on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and, you know, the, the main sort of topics that we're sort of quizzed on on, on a day to day. Um, so we'll cover them in this slide and we'll kind of give you an insight into that. And hopefully that can be helpful. And then, and yeah, we'll kind of um, follow up with any questions you additionally got on the, on the presentation. So the um, I think, uh, yeah, the, the main question that we, we sort of hear from investors is, of course, you know, what are the fees uh, and what are the charges? I mean, that's kind of the, the most primary uh, point that sort of clients are intrigued about. So. Yeah, so I mean, with fees, there's £65 per year, okay, GBP, that covers storage and insurance, uh, and that's per cask, first three years is complimentary, and that's including the transport from wherever the cask is being held in, um, up to, to our warehouse. Um, there's also the fee of um, between 10 to 15 percent on the exit should you want to sell that cast to us in the years to come. Um, you're not stuck with Braber in any shape or form. There is a question further down that, that kind of um, touches on this as well, so I'll go into more detail. But the charge is £65 per year for storage and insurance and an exit commission between 10 to 15 percent of the resale value. Okay. 
Um, so which age cask should I invest in? Um, it's a very good question. And again, I mean, this is really where we step in and we give guidance on, on what kind of the most suitable and, and uh, the best cask is for what you're looking to achieve. Um, to put it simply, I mean, it really depends on you know, what your time frames are, um, what your investment amount is, what you're comfortable investing. These are all the, the, the main factors that will help us give guidance and select the right age cask from the correct distillery or the most relevant distillery to help maximize your return. Um, I mean, if you look at most of the casks that we work with, I mean, we have younger casks, which would be sort of the new make, sort of between that zero to three years in age or the new fills. Um, they'll be tailored more so for investors that have a longer horizon in terms of their investment time frame. So 10 to 15 years in whole time, they're the perfect or more ideal assets for a client with that kind of an investment profile. And then if we move on to more mature casks, um, emerging or intermediate when they're between the five to 10 or 15 years in age or up to 20 sometimes, um, these are investments or assets or casks, sorry, that are more tailored for investors that are considering a shorter whole time to so something that's maybe five years or, or up to 10 years. Um, you know, there's always a, a cask at the right age that's always going to be ideally fit for someone with different investment goals. So it's, um, it's really for us to kind of match and find that right opportunity for them. Um, and, you know, we, we kind of go from there really. Yeah, I think it just very much depends on the investor goal. Uh, really, here is that's the main, um, the main answer. Um, of course, there's budget limitations, and you know, with more budget, you open up the doors to more mature casks. Uh, in essence, yeah. Um, so, in sorry, is the industry regulated, uh, and how would any investment be protected? And I think this is a very, very important question. Um, and it's something that many, I think most investors at one point yeah. um, during the sort of start of their knowledge building will be looking to, yeah. to ask. So I think that the simple answer here, the, the industry as such, so us trading cash, you buying cash, this is not regulated um, as you would perhaps expect with uh, stocks and shares. We were not a regulated industry from that perspective, okay? Um, we are very regulated from the perspective of storage, insurance, safekeeping of those uh, casts and of those assets. And because HMRC, the, the UK government, does not make money from uh, export duty up until that cask is being bottled. Um, and of course, they want to ensure that the level um, of quality for scotch is being kept and the um, you know prestige associated with this industry and with this liquid is being kept and, and safe kept basically for as many years as possible so that's why single more scotch cask can only be held in bonded warehouse to ensure the, the, the highest quality is there there's every single cast has a cask ID numbers associated with HMRC. The warehouse has a track record of every single cask and their management. Um, and also, you know, you have access to your login details, you have access to your um, certificates of ownership and everything else that you need to prove uh, ownership. Okay. Um, is it better to pay the premium for sherry casks or first fill bourbon? where available? Um, again, I mean, I think when it comes to considering what cask is most beneficial, um, I think what you need to consider, and this is something that we've discussed many times, uh, you need to consider you know, what is going to be more valuable or what is going to bring you um, a more unique selling point in the future. So traditionally, I mean, given the, the scale um, of the, the bourbon industry in America, there's a lot more supply or bourbon casks in circulation, which is why typically uh, you will see more single malt whiskey being matured in a bourbon barrel. So that's why there's obviously a lot more supply of those in the market. Um, now, if you move on to sherry uh, finish, I mean, sherry is a very rare, very finite um, finish to find on the market. And the reason being, of course, it is its origin is from the south of Spain, Jerez. Um, now, most sherry casks are earmarked by you know, some of the frontline, more top tier distilleries, Macallan, um, Lefroig, Balmore, Downmore. Um, these distilleries typically will be using you know, the sherry finished casks because, of course, there is a, a huge value out there. The flavor profile, the color profile, um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that adds value in later years. Now, 
given the limit in supply, of course, that's going, only going to be something of benefit to an investor later down the line. And that's really where you need to consider, you know, is paying a premium for Sherry now only going to benefit you in the next 5, 10, 15 years when you're selling this back to market? Um, you know, and you might have 10 bourbon barrels on the market and you might have just one Sherry bourbon cask on the market. And you can really see there where from an investment standpoint or from a bottler's standpoint, they're going to you know, pay more of a premium for something that is in more finite supply than something that's in more mass supply. So again, it really depends on you know, what your, your, your comfort range is for an investment. Um, but from you know, a, a premium standpoint, of course, I mean, sherry is always something that will typically add um, anywhere between you know, sort of 20 to 25 percent premium on a, on a resale value of a cask. So it is, it is definitely something to consider um, if the option is there, I would say. Definitely. Yeah. And there's also the option to, to re-rack. I think it's important to, yeah, yeah. To, um, to note this because it is a service that we provide and a lot of our clients tend to perhaps re-rack their uh, casks into sherry, into rum casks as well. Um, so there is the opportunity to do so. Okay, uh, we've got a few more questions. Yeah. Uh, so how can I sell my cask? <clears throat> um, so I shall let you take this one because I know that you're uh, very articulate in, in a different room. So. Um, there's there's a few ways. Um, okay, there's the opportunity to sell your cash through the Braeburn network. Um, now with that, it, there is the charge of between 10 and 15% on the exit um, that you need to, to keep in mind. The, the benefit with that is, of course, everything is managed. We will find you a um, investor, you know, the next buyer to your cask, whatever that may be, uh, an individual investor looking to purchase a more mature cask an independent bottling company um, or a, a private collector, okay? And the other option for you to sell your cash would be for you to basically find the next owner or the next buyer. Um, you know, that may be, um, we have a lot of clients that purchase these casks as uh, with the intention to leave something for their children, for their grandchildren. Of course, that's a simple transfer of ownership. There's, there's no uh, charges such from our end. Um, there is a small admin fee to basically help you get the documentation in order with everything, but we'll be there to assist you, okay? As, as we said from the beginning, you are the owner uh, the legal owner of this cask, of this asset. You can do as you please with it. Um, we're here to offer the service from purchasing to maturation to exit. Um, and we're here to help you guide, uh, to help guide you through, through the whole process. Yeah. I hope that, that answers that. So if investing in whiskey casks is such a good investment, why isn't it, why isn't everyone doing it? It's a great question. Um, I think the best way to look at this and, and something to consider is every investment market um, throughout time has shown seasonality, or should we say there's trends. Um, I mean, if we look at stock markets, for example, um, you know, from, well, I mean, if you look at sort of the boom from sort of early 70s up until the early of the 2000s, um, you know, people were had more access, more access and accessibility to investing in stocks. People had more investor confidence. It was something that was more well known. So more and more investors were entering the market at that time. Uh, you know, we come to modern day or from sort of the 2010s up until now. Um, you know, people have been investing in, in foreign exchange as an alternative asset or an asset class. And, you know, modern day times now, they're moving from the hard currency to cryptocurrency. You know, there is always trends and movement in what investors would deem as you know a, a, a suitable and, and, and profitable investment opportunity. Um, and again, I mean, the more volatile you know, modern markets become, and we're seeing this from stock markets, from crypto now as well. I mean, it's, they are very volatile markets in nature. Um, more and more investors are looking at alternative means um, and assets to invest some of their capital in, just as ways to you know, safeguard against you know the volatility that you do see from traditional markets um, or even ways just to you know, hedge and protect some of their wealth in an asset class that is, in essence, more low risk. And um, I mean, if we look at whiskey, uh, you know, it's built into the, the heritage and foundation of Scotland. I mean, there, there's so much history behind it um, that people, I think, are seeing this now as a good alternative option as a way to invest part of their money 
um, at a lower risk, something that's you know, going to bring them a, a nice steady rate of return year on year um, with obviously less of a, an impact or chance of that investment taking a downturn. So I think to put it simply, I mean, over time, more and more investors are, are exploring different options. And I think that's why whiskey now is becoming um, you know, something that more and more people are considering as an alternative so yeah it's, it's more knowledge i think the knowledge gap the more people learn the more they're willing to to embark on new things i hope that's a, sort of my input on that one you agree i i completely agree with that josh um i think there's just one more question here oh sorry yeah uh what taxes am i liable to pay on my investments um there is no capital gains tax on the resale uh, as long as that cash stays in full cash form. And um, if you're a UK based um, investor, okay, um, that is the, the one thing that we're certain of. Uh, obviously, everyone's uh, tax situation is different. So we, we won't be able to kind of give you concrete advice as such. The only thing that we can say is, of course, check with your financial advisor wherever you're based. Um, a lot of our clients have uh, dual nationalities. Uh, they reside in different countries. Uh, they might be liable to different uh, taxes in, in different locations. So check um, check before obviously making, making an investment because every single person's um, situation is different, okay? Um, would you add anything to any of those questions before we go to the... No, no, I think um, well, I hope we covered them clearly and um, sort of given you an insight into some of the sort of common things that people ask. Um, but no, I mean, yeah, again, we'll kind of move on now to the, you know, the, the sort of open up the floor to, to you to ask questions now and we can kind of... Um, yeah. I think there's been a few questions coming in. Let me just try to sort this out. Okay. So... Um, Got some great questions. Interested to know how taxes are handled from non-UK, non-EU residents. Okay, um, so again, on, on that one, we we haven't got the, the specific. Just no capital gains tax on um, exit as long as that cash stays in full cash form. Um, we have a few more here. Let's see. Here we go. So. Yeah, so for Jeff, uh, to answer your question, so have you changed cask ownership title works? Um, as you, you say, you bought casks uh, previously and the titles um, have changed recently. So yeah, just to clarify on that point, so we did do um, sort of a review on our ownership certificates just recently. Um, and this was more so just um, for technicality, just to ensure that we're covering ourselves on our side as well. Um, but the wording in the document and the ownership itself remains the same. So the asset is still hold, held under your ownership. So you are the beneficial owner of the asset. Um, but again, all Brayburn Whiskey do in terms of our relationship with that class. The is, custodians, basically. Yeah, the custodians. We're just safekeeping the asset um, on, on your behalf. You're the legal owner. You can do as you please with, with the asset. Um, but just on that point, actually, Jeff, um, I mean, we'll have the sort of your own personal portfolio manager follow up on that if you want some more clarity on it, of course. Yeah. Uh, Brian is asking, why are the casts not left at the whiskey distillery or their bonded warehouse? Um, if Brabant is not around in 15 years and the cask is in your bonded warehouse, that is your asset, how do we get it out? Um, good question, Brian. So the casks um some of the suppliers that we work with they don't allow us to transfer the casks into our warehouse um that will be stated to you before purchasing most of the casks we can transfer them into our warehouse the reason we built the warehouse is to offer a a full uh, fully managed uh, service here uh, brian basically from uh, entering the market from purchasing your cask to storage um, and to exit, okay? There is the opportunity, of course, to go and see your cask. It's just something that um, adds a little bit more of a uniqueness to this type of investment. Further down the line, we, we do want to expand that warehouse and have a tasting facility and just give some, uh, give, give our clients something more than just a piece of paper, basically. We want you to enjoy your asset. It's, something unique and we want to make your experience more unique okay and um, if Brayburn is not around what will happen with your cask it's a very good question we get this asked a lot um, we're actually um, also kind of 
all of our casks are also under someone else's custod custodianship. So Caledonian casks are our um, sort of custodians. So if anything were to happen with Braeburn um, as a business, and we weren't here in the next 10, 15 years, whenever you want to exit your cask, you have the certificate of ownership. The warehouse knows of your receipt of your cask, and you are still the legal owner of that cask. It's just simple. The custodianship, so the safekeeping of that cask, gets transferred into a different account. Colonial casks. Okay. Um, Klaus, how does the move from the distillery warehouse impact the value of the whiskey? Some distilleries do not allow this with their uh, brand because of so much character of the whiskey can come from the climate this round. Very good question. Correct. Yeah. Um, so again, I mean, different suppliers that we work with will have different guidelines as to what we can and can't do with movement. Um, we see this typically a lot with McAllen, um, obviously. Um, so depending on how each distillery will safeguard their liquid, um, many of them do, of course, um, believe that the, and it is true, the climate, you know, the environment in which the whiskey is maturing in will, of course, impact uh, you know, the flavor profile, the way in which that liquid is breathing and taking in this environment. I mean, perfect example is Isla. Any Isla whiskey, typically, you know, the flavor profile it brings in its environment from the coast, from the ocean, the saltiness. Um, so it is something to consider, of course. Um, but that is, again, something that we disclose to every client. So every cast that we sell, we will always discuss what is to be done in terms of the movement and the storage for that cask. Um, and if the cask is to be stored in the distillery, that's always discussed with the client so they know exactly where that cask is to be held. Um, and so they can kind of make the decision as to there as to whether that's something they would like to, to invest in. But I hope that kind of um, gives a bit of insight into that. Further to Brian's question, what happens if Braben were to enter administration or liquidation? So I think we, we answered this, Stuart. Um, yeah, no, nothing would happen in terms of your ownership. You would still be the legal owner of the of the cask. Um, I mean, look, obviously, with with anything that that's happening in the world, you know, Braben might not be around in the next twenty years. Who knows? There is a fair sort of concern. Just to give you a bit of reassurance and peace of mind, um, we are owned by a larger company. We're a group of uh, five whiskey companies, three e-commerce platforms two focused on the European market, one focused on the Asian market. And um, as the independent, uh, the, the investment uh, branch and the investment focus uh, side of the business. And we also have an independent bottling sort of focused um, company. So we're, we're not just sort of a, a smaller institution and um, we, we're here to stay. Uh, but of course, absolutely fair concerns there from, from you, Stuart and, and Brian, I think, uh, is it Klaus? No, uh, Brian. Brian Klaus. Um, Axel, what do you sorry? What do you look for in long term value increase of a whiskey brand? Considering Springbank and McAllen are on opposite ends of brand presentation and company philosophy, there does not seem to be a single formula. Of course not. Um, again, I mean, whiskey at the forefront is driven by consumer. So what people enjoy drinking and um, the reputation of a distillery, the quality. But, you know, everyone prefers different whiskeys. You know, some like peat, some like non-peated, different regions will have different flavours. Every distillery will be considered as beautiful in different ways from different consumers. You know, there's different USPs to every distillery. I, and, and I think with every with with any other investment, it's important to kind of leave emotions aside and preference and, and sort of personal preferences aside. Um, here we're talking about sort of uh, brand presentation, I guess, tasting notes and whatnot. As an investment, that doesn't necessarily come into play. It doesn't necessarily impact the investment apart from the top sort of premium uh, blue chip casks. And um, when we recommend an investment, we always look at the, um, the distillery's ambitions, their plans for further expansion, their markets they're operating, their ownership, who are they owned by a larger sort of conglomerate perhaps, you know, Diageo, Bacardi, uh, Edgington Group, White and Mackay, we always look at these um, factors in order to ensure that the, um, the recommendation that we put in place is stable, is sound, and it has prospect for growth. It has the ambition to become a top of the shelf distillery. Um, we look at some very, uh, I, I wouldn't say very new, but, but newer distilleries that already have very high ambitions um, and they already 
place themselves as you know, selling uh, non ace statement bottles for 170 quid. That's something that we that we look at when we recommend something. Um, there's distilleries that have been around since the beginning of 1800s. <clears throat> Two world wars, global pandemics, uh, economic crashes, um, wars in, in everywhere in the world uh, happened, and they're still here. They're still here producing whiskey. Okay, we're always looking at these type of key indicators when making a recommendation. Uh, we're not necessarily tailoring our uh, recommendations based on needs, but more so on, on, on the facts and on the conditions. So it's analysis, essentially. You know, yes. In-depth analysis is something that, you know, it's always considered and done on our side to ensure that the investment is, um, you know, it's a good proposition. Yeah, uh, Nicholas. So, is there no Braben markup on the initial purpose? Um, yes, there is. So, this is one way that we make um, our money. Um, we purchase casks uh, from different suppliers. That may be individual investors. That may be select suppliers. That may be straight from the distillery itself. Um, we purchase in, in in bulk. Basically, we we use our reputation. We use our network. We use our uh, economies of scale in essence yeah, purchasing power i mean we've been in the market and we've obviously working with a large number of suppliers again this is sort of ties into our business model doesn't it you know yeah. we're, we're purchasing these cars in bulk so we've, you know, we have a lot of buying power so there is of course a benefit for us and there is money you know a fraction or a portion yeah. to be made and, on the um on the purchasing side exactly. of course, yeah. and, and i'm sure that the next questions i haven't read through all of them but there, there will be you know how much margin are we making um very much depends on the cost or on the cost that, that we um, are able to acquire those casts from okay there's no set uh, figure there's no set um, anything okay it very much depends and of course that now more than any any other time there's more competition out there people go out and shop i'm sure you've looked at other companies before deciding to get in touch with us um we need to stay competitive as well okay um on average, how many bottles does a cask yield? Again, it can vary. Um, typically, we work with a hogshead cask. Um, so that's, I'd say, probably 95% of the casks we see are hogsheads. Um, and they're 250 litres. So, I mean, typically, depending on obviously the age, the older uh, the cask, the older the liquid, the more evaporation it would have seen in its life. So a bit of a less boss account. But if you're looking at a new make or a new fill, uh, hogshead it's, it's sort of anywhere between sort of 300 to 350 bottles around about that is what you can see also depends on when when you bottle that cask of course with evaporation with the angel share the, the older the cask um, is the lesser of a bottle count uh, there will be because of the abb being being lower uh, alex what is your relationship with cask 88 um, sister company, we're owned by the same group. They are mainly focused towards the <coughs> independent bottling um, sort of casks. So uh, we've got different stock in essence, but we're owned by the same company. Yeah. Matt Tring, uh, as a beginner investor, what is the minimum investment requirement? Um, good question. So the, the minimum typically, again, is it would be looking at a new fill or a new make, something very infant in age. Um, and they typically start at sort of two and a half thousand sterling, um, anywhere up to sort of a, a maximum of, sort of 5,000, I would say. So that's typically uh, your kind of starting point um, if you are new to the market. So sort of yeah. a recommendation. Uh, we, we see that the typical or the, the average investment for UK based clients um, is somewhere around the 15, 20,000 pound mark. Um, we see that the higher end, as we said before, it's a 1.2 million uh, cast. There's anything in terms of uh, cost between sort of that three, 4,000 pound up until that 1.2. Uh, million okay uh, so very much depends um who was it that asked that question josh just scrolling up a little bit uh, matt very much depends on what your comfort level is okay um right a couple more questions we've got five minutes so axel is there any guidance from braben when finding the sweet spot on when a whiskey is ready to be bottled uh, perfect balance of cask and distillery character. Is there some kind of master blender? <laughs> uh, we're all master blenders. Uh, no, so sweet spot, um, 
I'd say there are definitely different factors, different elements to consider when finding the perfect cask. And again, that's really what we look to do here. Um, we tailor every recommendation around you. So what you're interested in, uh, what you're looking to invest again, what your investment profile is. These are the sweet spots. These are the factors that will help us identify exactly what cask is going to fit you best. But again, um, you know, we touched on this as one of the FAQs. I mean, you have to consider things like rarity, uh, the finish, if you're looking at a sherry or a rum, um, you know, what different factors will help contribute and help profit or complement your asset so that in the future, it maximizes the potential return that you'll see. Um, and, and the uniqueness, because you're, you're talking about bottling, you want to have something unique, something that you created yourself. We're talking about re-racks as well here, so transferring the cask, sorry, the liquid inside the cask into a different wood finish. Um, and that cannot be any more unique than, than that, basically. So if you're looking to create your own sort of blend, and your, not blend, your own single mold, but blend it with different cask finish, you can do so, okay? Uh, and I think Vipo was asking, uh, what certification should one look for uh, as an investor for an organization like yours? So the certificates of ownership, you'll be receiving them in the post. So that basically covers your, your ownership uh, title with the cast details, with all the ins and outs of the cast specifics. Um, that is something that you need to safe keep, basically. You also have an e-version of that on your online portal, and I think that's what you're asking next. Um, do your clients have an online portal access to see what their cash value is as of that day? Um, so yes, everything is uploaded to our client uh, portal. You'll have your login details after you make the purchase within sort of two weeks. And in there, on a year-to-year -year basis, um, at the very least, sometimes twice a year, we make an up-to-date valuation of all your casks in line with market conditions. So that may be um, on the cask's birthday or slightly after or before. Um, it's just basically in case we notice some sort of uh, market changes or moves, um, we're able to, to reflect that onto your portal so you can see that being updated regularly. And of course, myself and Josh's portfolio managers, as I said before, we will connect with you at least on a year to year basis. A lot of the times, I mean, our clients message us um, all the time. So we're, we're, we're happy to, um, to, to help with any questions and give you up to date valuations as often as you request. But the change in value won't be dramatic, at least you do it sort of once per year. Yeah. Um, sorry, another question from Alex. So what's the procedure to see my cask? Um, so again, I mean, this is, this is really why we uh, moved to having our own facility to give you a bit more flexibility with this. Um, so you simply just contact your portfolio manager and let them know that you're looking to arrange a visit and that you'd like to go and see your cask or casks. Um, and they can book that in with the warehouse team. So the team there that are on the ground and managing these casks. Um, we, we're taking bookings now, so we've already had clients up at the, uh, the facility that are sort of doing tours and, and drawing samples from their casks. Um, it, I think it's important as well, Josh. I mean, it, it is it is a working site, so it is a, a facility that's still not you know at a hundred percent operational capacity. So we we are accommodating visits, and we just need uh, a bit of notice, and and we'll make sure that you'll be able to see your casks. Okay. Um, last question we've got literally one minute. Uh, Alistair, have you ever struggled to sell a cask? Um, depends on how you defines struggle, I guess. Um, we've sold some casts within a couple of hours. Um, we've sold some casts within a couple of weeks. Um, th there's there's no real struggle in terms of, you know, very long waiting times as such, because we have such a big network. Um, I think with... typically it's the maximum is two to three weeks. And again, you're looking at premium casts, more mature casts, will always typically take longer, as you could imagine, because of course the you know, the majority of investors that are willing to invest uh, will be in smaller value casks. So the greater the value, the smaller the portion of our network that would be interested. But again, you know, it's, I would yeah. say, and, and that would be a unique cask that you'll be, you'll be looking to put on, on the market. So um, absolutely no, no struggle there at all. Um, last year uh, was the first proper year where we sold uh, a good amount of casks and I can tell you all of them uh, flew by. We've, we've had very good uh, reviews so far.
Okay. Um, we're running out of time. So just to, to, to close this off now, um, just want to say thank you again for joining us and for taking the time one hour of your day. Um, we will send you the recording over email so you can share that with friends and uh, colleagues, whoever might be interested and you can use it as a future uh, as a reference for the future um, and we will be in touch we'll obviously make sure that we let your uh, dedicated portfolio manager know that you've attended this um, webinar and they'll be in touch with any uh, questions or you can be in touch with any questions and we'll be more than happy to to answer so we hope you enjoyed it yeah. um thank and you all for joining so, yeah uh, we hope it was you know, helpful and insightful and uh, we hope to um hear from you all soon perfect fantastic bye